I think we need more guides for Guild Wars 2. So, hi, I'm Rubel, and this is my beginner's guide for how to play Heal Alacrity Druid. Druid is probably one of the strongest healers in the game, with maybe the most actual healing output of all the meta healers, uh, and it has extreme carry potential for pugs and for static groups. It's also one of the few healers that's good at keeping a full 10-person raid group alive all on their own, which is awesome for organized raid groups who want to try for faster kills. First, I want to touch on what this build is for and what its role is, as well as some general tips. This will pretty much cover the same stuff for any further build guides I make, so I'll include a bit more basic info here and refer back to it in future videos to try and keep them a bit shorter. So this is a group PvE build, which means it's primarily meant for use in raids and strikes. It's also perfectly good healer for fractals, though it's not often fractal groups ask for anything other than a firebrand as a healer. The healer's role in group PvE is to provide healing to its subgroup, along with a bunch of boons to increase survivability and damage output. Your subgroup is the party of five that you are sorted into by your commander, and pretty much all of your skills will only hit yourself and your four other party members. There are exceptions to this, but that's for another video about solo healing specifically. This is just for general use. Along with healing, the other critical part of your role is providing the lion's share of the boons for your party. You'll always bring full uptime of one of the two key boons as a healer, alacrity or quickness along with as much might as possible, then also fury, protection, regen, and swiftness. Bonus points for the more extra boons. They're pretty strong, uh, and a lot of classes have traits that cause them to deal more damage for each unique boon they have, so adding more boons is always a good thing. Healers are also usually responsible for giving stability to their subgroup to negate knockback or other CC or interrupts on the party, or using Aegis to block the attacks that apply those. Tanks in Guild Wars 2 are also pretty much always just a healer in tankier gear, so healers are also expected to tank certain encounters. Don't worry, tanking is super fun and chill in Guild Wars 2. Lastly, I want to touch on a method I use to learn new builds without it feeling like too much of a chore. I won't be exhaustively going into what every effect of every button in your kit is, or reading every trait out to you or anything like that, but I'll obviously mention a lot of them. So my method for learning new builds is very simple. I watch a video or read a guide to get a basic understanding of what I need to do. Then when I go to play the build, I will spend every moment waiting for ready checks, just reading my skills over and over. I start with my profession and weapon skills until there is literally no point in reading them again because I have them memorized. After that, I will do the same for the other side of my bar. Once I know all of the skills, I'll move on to doing the same for my traits. You can really keep going after that and read all the available skills and trait lines and weapon skills if you want to learn everything there is to know about a class, but you really don't need to. If you just follow this method, you can pick up new builds really easily and with some kind of direction to help you, as with a new build it can be really overwhelming trying to sort through all of the new buttons and effects and which are important and which are not. So, Druid. First thing is to get the setup. We're not going to cook up anything crazy here, this has kind of been pretty well solved. We're going to plug in the Snowcrows build and we'll go from there. There's one sort of distinct variant besides the one that Snowcrows shows that uses the skirmishing trait line with the quick draw trait. I'm not going to cover that in this video, but you'll be able to learn it very very easily after you learn how to use this build. It's very strong and it provides a little bit more healing than this build for a little bit less CC. Okay, so the gear is everything Harriers with monk runes. Snowcrows has some givers pieces in there, but I only recommend getting those if you want to learn to tank. You can replace givers with Harriers one to one. In an ideal world, you would have another gear set with full givers or full minstrel stats for tanking, but just start out with this. The relic we use is Relic of Karakosa because we have access to a lot of blast finishes and thus get great value out of it. If you don't have access to the Relic of Karakosa, you can use Relic of the Monk instead. Everyone has access to this. For weapons, we use Mace Warhorn for its boon coverage and Staff for its healing output. If you don't have Mace unlocked, you can use an Axe in the meantime, but the Mace is really very powerful, so you should work on unlocking that. The sigils are the same for both sets and are Transference for the extra healing modifier, and Paralyzation for the increased CC. Note that this does also apply to your dazes, 
even though it only specifies stun. The traits and skills on the Snow Crow's build are also what I would recommend as the standard setup, along with the pets. With this setup, you'll be providing alacrity and healing through your special Celestial Avatar skills, as well as a ton of boons and healing from your weapon and utility skills. You also have a truly incredible amount of CC for Defiance Bars, two stability skills, and one of the most powerful res skills in the game. You also do a weirdly high amount of damage for a healer. Like, well, that's, that's kind of weird. There are a few changes you can make to the build as well if needed, but generally the standard setup is fine for most fights. You can swap Cultivated Synergy to Druidic Clarity if you need more Condi Cleanse, and you can also swap Verdant Etching to Celestial Shadow if you want the extra mobility from Super Speed. For skills, the only skills I would think about changing would be the healing skill, which you could swap out for Healing Spring if you prefer it or if you need the Condi Cleanse, and Glyph of Equality, which you could swap for Search and Rescue if you think the pull and res potential will help your team more than the CC and stability. If you haven't played Ranger before, its class mechanic is its pet. Rangers can assign two pets that they can swap between with a cooldown during combat. You gather your pets from around Terrier and tame them to add them to your choices. Your pet generally just hangs around and does a bit of damage, but they also have a skill called a beast skill, which you can make them use on demand, and it usually has a useful utility effect like CC. The standard pets on the Snow Crows build are Iboga for its high damage and CC skill, and Electric Wyvern for its high CC. If needed, you can drop the Iboga for a specialized pet like the White Tiger for an extra Aegis, or the Turtle for a projectile blocking bubble or just another powerful CC pet like the Rock Gazelle. Before we move on, we need to talk briefly about Celestial Avatar and Druid Fluid. Druid gains access to an additional profession mechanic alongside its pet from base ranger. This is called Celestial Avatar. While you're not in Celestial Avatar, you generate your Druid Fluid over time, which is this blue bar over your dodges. You generate extra fluid every time you heal something, and every time you hit something. This only cares about the number of heals or hits, not the magnitude. Faster hits or more individual applications of healing is more fluid. When your bar is full, and only when it is full, you can press the button and enter the avatar state. You'll gain new skills in place of your weapon skills, and any glyphs you have in your utility slots will change to their alternate form. You also slowly drain Druid Fluid while you're in Celestial Avatar. Every skill in Celestial Avatar is some form of healing, except for the 5 skill, which is an AoE slow and immobilize. When you leave Celestial Avatar, it goes on cooldown. Now we're going to go over the basic opener and skills you want to cast off cooldown. An opener is just a combo of skills you use at the start of a fight or phase to set you up with a good foundation of boons for your subgroup. A clean opener drastically increases the burst damage of your subgroup, as well as the ease of boon upkeep throughout the phase. Your opener should always prioritize ramping your group to 25 might, as well as giving fury, alacrity, protection, regen, and swiftness, then following up with as many extra boons as you can. If we were talking about a quickness healer, uh, you would just replace alacrity with quickness. Alrighty, the opener. In this example, I've only given myself quickness with the practice console, uh, as your quick DPS should be given quickness as early as they can into the encounter, so you should get at some point early during your opener, um, but all of the other boons you see are coming from the opener. So we start with our Warhorn set and our non Iboga pet. While we're running to the boss, we cast our Sun Spirit, then use Warhorn 5 and pet swap at the same time as casting Warhorn 5. Then we'll go into Celestial Avatar and immediately use Celestial Avatar 4, followed by 5. Then we can use 3 Stone Spirit and then spam 1 and 2 until 4 and 5 come off cooldown. You'll know you've got this down when you can finish casting your second Celestial Avatar 4 and 5 before you run out of juice. Sometime in there you can use your Iboga's Beast skill to trigger a trait to give some more of a boon buffer. After that, all you need to do to continue applying your boons is just cast these skills off cooldown. The third hit of your auto chain will apply the very extra Vigor boon, which gives player faster dodge recharges. 
Outside of your opener, you want to get into Celestial Avatar and out as soon as possible, while giving as much alacrity as possible. The sooner you're out, the sooner you can go back in. To that end, outside of our opener, we'll do a short combo of 4 and 5, then follow up with a 3 and a few 1s and 2s. If you feel like you were late getting into Celestial Avatar, you can stay for longer to generate more alacrity. This is the bit where I'll mention that Celestial Avatar 2 can be cast any time it's off cooldown without interrupting any other skills. You can use this to get more alacrity out of your time in Celestial Avatar by spamming it off cooldown, including during your opener, but don't feel like you're failing if you don't pick up this skill for a while. If you notice your might stacks keep falling off from 25, you can keep pet swapping off cooldown. But if you can avoid swapping off of Iboga, this is where most of that big healer DPS comes from. Most groups will generate a decent amount of might passively, so there's a good chance you can be greedy here, but it's worth paying attention to. I've talked a lot about boons so far, because they're kind of the first thing you need to do in a fight, but now we're on to the other main part of your job, the healing. Generally your regen ticks and your mace 2 healing will cover most ambient damage that your subgroup takes, but when push comes to shove, Druid can really shove some heals. You probably won't commit all of this to memory first try, but mainly try to remember the staff and celestial avatar stuff. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, there's your healing skill. Whichever one of the two options you pick, it's going to be a big heal and it's going to deal with most issues pretty quickly. After that though, there is the celestial avatar skills. Apart from celestial avatar 5, all of the other skills in celestial avatar are great healing buttons, with 4 and 3 being the strongest. If Celestial Avatar isn't available because you just made Alacrity, you can swap to your Staff for an easy burst healing combo with Staff 5 followed by Staff 3 into the water field from Staff 5. Staff 2 is also a decent healing over time effect, and your Staff autos heal players slightly when the beam touches them. Note that you can target enemies or allies with Staff autos and Staff 2. You can also use your Elite skill in Celestial Avatar or out of Celestial Avatar. It makes a large healing AoE with bonus effects based on whether or not you are in Celestial Avatar when you cast it. Your elite skill is also a water field, which neatly brings me to the last big aspect of our healing, blast combos. A blast finisher used in a water field generates a decent healing burst in an AoE. Combining this with our Karakosa relic, this is going to make for some pretty chunky heals whenever we manage to blast a water field. Note, you don't need to blast a water field to get the effect from Relic of Karakosa, it's just that water fields are what we'll be going for when we're trying to heal as much as we can. To do a blast combo, you just use a blast finisher in or on a combo field. The water field is usually denoted by this blue ring, but some skills, like our Star 5, don't have that. Our water fields that we have access to are Star 5, Celestial Avatar 4, Healing Spring if you chose that, and our elite glyph. Our blast finishes are Staff 3, Mace 3, Warhorn 5, Celestial Avatar 3, Pet Swap, and Sown Spirit. It does a funny dance when it slams, it's great. Once you have this somewhat memorized, the use is fairly natural, but a few combos that aren't immediately obvious are Stone Spirit into immediately using Celestial Avatar 4, or using Pet Swap while channeling Celestial Avatar 4. You can do both of these at once for an insane burst heal. Lastly, you can also cast Celestial Avatar 2 at the same time as casting Celestial Avatar 3 for a blast finisher in the light field of Celestial Avatar 2. This is an AoE Condi cleanse, not the healing burst from a water field, um, but it is basically a free Karakosa trigger. To finish off, if that doesn't sound like enough healing, we do need to talk about the Nature's Strength buff from Mace. If your head is already kind of spinning, you can pretty much mentally mark this part as figure out later, because if you focus on what I already went over, you won't be wanting for extra healing. That being said, we'll talk about how this works, because it is very, very strong. Nature's Strength is a stacking effect that you gain from casting Mace 2 and 3, and also from finishing an auto attack chain on Mace. When at 4 stacks, the next cast of Mace 2 or 3 will reset the cooldown of both, so it will give you a double cast of whichever one you use to trigger this, as well as giving you the Force of Nature buff, which basically just makes you 10% better at dealing damage and healing for 5 seconds. In general, I use this to reset Mace 3 for the double CC, or double healing from Blast Finishes. 
as that is more healing than the healing stapled onto a double mace too. You can also keep the buff after swapping weapons or going to Celestial Avatar, so it can be used to supercharge those two crazy healing kits. You will passively get value from this, even without thinking about it, so it's not a big deal to skim over this section for now. Alright, CC. This build has a lot of buttons that can be used to obliterate defiance bars. Mace 3 and Warhorn 5 are both CC skills, as is Glyph of Equality while you're not in Celestial Avatar. Glyphs have two versions, one out of Celestial Avatar and one in Celestial Avatar. Also, Celestial Avatar 3 is a daze. Celestial Avatar 5 can be used to apply Slow, Cripple, and Immobilize, which is a surprisingly large amount of defiance damage over time. Additionally, you can use your Iboga's pull skill, as well as Pet Swap to Wyvern to use its skill, which is also a large CC. Most of those are skills that you're using off cooldown to upkeep boons, so unless you know a fight well and you save them in anticipation of a defiance bar, the first skills you should look to for defiance break are your glyph and your pet skills. Remember, if you want more CC, you can bring the rock gazelle instead of iboga. Stability and aegis are powerful boons that can be used to negate certain mechanics. Stability prevents players from being interrupted by crowd controls, and aegis blocks a single attack. You have two group stability sources in the standard build, Glyph of Equality and Glyph of the Stars, your elite skill. Glyphs have different effects depending on whether or not you use them in Celestial Avatar mode. Both of these glyphs will give stability in or out of Celestial Avatar form, but Equality gives more stacks in Celestial Avatar. In terms of Aegis, your Stone Spirit will give Aegis shortly after its cast, and you can also swap your Iboga for the White Tiger pet for an extra source of Aegis. This is usually what I do if I need Aegis on a fight, as we want to be using Stone Spirit off cooldown to upkeep protection, so it's not always available to block those key mechanics. Now we'll tidy up the last few important bits of the build. Like any good healer, Druid can cleanse a lot of conditions. The standard build can use Glyph of the Stars and Celestial Avatar 2, but on any fight that features a lot of conditions, you should definitely bring the Healing Spring, and just use it whenever your group gets a lot of conditions. This lets you save Glyph of the Stars for its most powerful use case. Additionally, anytime you blast combo a light field, you will cleanse a Condi from your subgroup. You only have access to one short-lived light field of your own, but you can apply the same tricks I mentioned in the water combo section to squeeze blasts into it if you need to. You probably won't though. Healing Spring is really good, and Celestial Avatar 2 whenever you're in CA is probably enough condition cleanse. You can also make that trait swap to Druidic Clarity. Just before I mentioned the most powerful use case for Glyph of the Stars, your elite skill. When you cast Glyph of the Stars in Celestial Avatar form, any down players in the AoE will quickly be healed and stand back up. This is one of the most powerful res tools in the game and has potential to save a run even if all nine other players are downed. Lastly, we have access to Decent Projectile Block with Star 5, which deletes projectiles and shoots out its own healing projectiles instead. Oh wow, it looks really pretty if you have a legendary staff too, whoa. We can also bring the Siege Turtle Pet for the worst bubble in the game. That brings us to the end of the guide. There's a lot more to learn about Druid, and a lot more alterations you could make to the build to suit your preference or the encounter. But this video is just meant to be a strong start for new druids and healers. In the future I may make a longer, more in-depth video covering some more advanced druid gameplay, but I have more to learn myself before I make that video. In the meantime, I'll be working on creating more guides like this one for other classes. I also stream on Twitch if you want to catch me live, that's linked in the description. Also linked is the Acceleration Raid Training Discord, which is where I learned to raid, and where you can go if you also want to learn. Myself and many other volunteers run training events weekly and help players get their legendary armor from raids. If you have any questions or want to discuss or add to anything I've said in this video, I'm sure I won't struggle to respond to every comment, so feel free to ask away. For now, that's all from me. If you like the video and you want to see more, you know what to do to help me out. I'm a brand new YouTube channel, so every bit of interaction helps a ton and is very much appreciated.